Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Hello, I'm Colony Town Judge Peter Crummy, and welcome to Benchmark. We'll explore a variety of issues involving our justice system, our legal system, and how they intersect with the citizens of the town of Colony. Today, we're truly fortunate to have as our guest a premier matrimonial attorney who's been practicing in Albany for nearly 60 years. And please join me in welcoming attorney Robert Kahn. Thank you, Judge. Glad Thank to you. be here. Well, we're thrilled to have you here, and it's such a special time for all of us. As you and I have found out over the course of our own practices, and of course your distinguished practice for 60 years now, that matrimonial issues are, are very prevalent in our legal system and certainly demand uh, expertise uh, by attorneys uh, in many situations. And, of course, some interesting background about you and how you got into matrimonial law to the length and extent that you have. Of course, a Siena College graduate as well, and that's why we get to call you our own here with Siena College being here in the uh, great town of Colony. But then Albany Law School, class of 1951, and from there, uh, continuing to practice on, on State Street, first at 91 State Street, in and around the, the former Ten Eyck Hotel, and then now at uh, then from there uh, for nearly 60 years at 90 State Street, where you and I both practice today. Correct. How did you first get into the practice of matrimonial law after C after Albany Law School? Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to take exception to a couple of things. You said distinguished. Hey, maybe yes, maybe no. <laughs> but you used the word expert, and I never use that word expertise because. The matrimonial field is um, dynamic. It's not static. It changes, I used to say, changes every month. Really, it changes every week because there's precedent, there's new types of cases, and it's a fascinating practice that matrimonial law gives to a lawyer because of that, because there's always new challenges, there's always new uh, methods of approaching and solving a case for your client. Uh, but get, I don't want to avoid your question. The way I got into it is that um, I enjoyed working with people, and I think you have to like that. If you like people, you would like the matrimonial practice. It is dealing with people that are uh, extremely nervous and in stress and suffering aggravation because it's the breakup or the death of a marriage, somebody that you love, somebody that you cared for, somebody that you gave your life for. You've got children, you've got grandchildren, you've got parents, and it involves all of those people. And they're all part of the, the program that you're creating with the divorce. So we really, and most divorce lawyers do this, work on trying to reconcile, get them to a marriage counselor, get somebody, one of the spouses to AA or to cure their problem with gambling or temper. There's even agencies that deal with temper today. That That's right, anger management. Anger management. Sure. I, you're more familiar with that. You're the esteemed judge, the expert judge that you are, and you're highly recognized, and uh, it's my pleasure to be here, my pleasure to know you, and uh, know of your many, many accomplishments. Uh, I started with a man by the name of Simon Rosenstock, who was kind of a, a mentor in many ways. And uh, being with him for a, a year plus, uh, I learned much more probably than I did in a year in law school. Uh, it was tough times. Talk about tough times today. It was tough times in the 1950s, right after the Second World War. I remember that I was able to get a job for the uh, exalted amount of $10 a week. I was lucky to get it, As too. As an intern uh, with uh, right. Attorney after, Rosenstein. Right, after graduating and being a company $10 a lawyer. week. $10 right. a week. Yep. I didn't spend it everywhere. I was very careful, and I saved up thousands of dollars over the year. <laughs> 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 uh, but it was worth every penny that I did not earn. I enjoyed it. 
And you know, you told me that in, in uh, his practice uh, that you came to work in, actually these issues, these matrimonial issues, were ones that he didn't want to do as much and he asked you to take them and handle right. them. He, many people uh, avoid matrimonial proceedings because they are difficult. You deal with people that are at their wit's end. I mean, they're nervous, they're upset, they're under doctor's care, they're under medicine. I've had 16 murders in my practice, meaning uh, spouses that killed one another, children involved, and I have a list of that that have happened because of the extreme pressure that the uh, individuals found themselves involved in. Right. And uh, it always weighs heavily on me, and I'm always very careful about dealing with people's emotions because they're very, it's very difficult, and I understand that. Uh, it's not something you just cure with words. You've got to try to understand their problem, and you've got to try to deal with it as they see it, not as you see it, as they see it. And uh, you've got to walk a little bit in their shoes. You've got to walk into their problem. You've got to walk into their family life. I always invite the, the parent in or somebody of interest to the client that could be moral support, that could give information, that could work with me to either bring them to a successful conclusion about right. a reconciliation or to bring about the divorce that is inevitable in some cases. Have you found over the uh, course of practice, and uh, you and I have spoken about this uh, a number of times, that uh, the matrimonial practice in the 50s, the, the, um, the, the, the file uh, was uh, certainly not as um, voluminous as it is today, and yet many are telling us that the state legislature and others are making matrimonial law easier or, and easier to practice, but actually you and I are finding it's, it's much more complicated. Have you noticed a, a series of, 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 of factors over the years where actually the files are much more voluminous and the issues are much more involved? I could compare it to the income tax return, which in the 1950s was one or two pages, and it was fairly easy to understand. Now you wake, they've done this. Ask 100 or 200 accountants to prepare a, a, the form for a, somebody, a taxpayer today, and they all come up with different conclusions. And it's the same with matrimonials. It becomes more and more involved, more and more cases come down, more and more precedents are heard, and it's a, a gray area. At best, there's something to be said for both sides of a divorce case, the woman or the man. The woman has her side. The, there's many cases on her side. There's many cases on the man's side. There's an uncertainty to litigation that you must advise your client that you do not know the end of a trial. You can't predict what the trial judge is going to say or how it's going to come about because there's a very, very wide range of uncertainty. And the, you've got to choose those cases which are in your client's best interest. And the other lawyer is not lazy. He or she will also pick the cases that justify sure. her client's uh, conduct. So therefore, when you go into a case, there's no such thing as guarantees, a slam dunk, which I hear often, and people will say, uh, my case is simple. There are no simple divorces because people are not simple. People are complex. Of course they are. And the divorce that they bring to the office is complex. You know, Bob, I note that uh, the legislation uh, was adopted last year by our New York State Legislature, became effective in October of 2010, uh, of creating what some people commonly refer to as no-fault divorce, that no longer did uh, one, uh, one spouse have to make certain allegations against the other in order to um, uh, enjoy uh, the divorce. And yet, it really doesn't replace the existing uh, formats for divorce, does it? No, it doesn't, Judge. The, um, there's six grounds for divorce under the, when I say the old law, which has been in effect since, since the 1960s, 60s, 67 sure. or 66. Right. And it always keeps changing and evolving and growing and not always necessarily for the better, sometimes for the more complex. So this didn't, the new law, as you mentioned, uh, irretrievable breakdown of the marriage did not replace adultery, cruel and human treatment, and separation for a period of one year. It added a seventh ground. 
and in many ways it makes the divorce more palatable to the spouses and their children because you don't have to fling anger, uh, fault, uh, somebody gambles or somebody is uh, alcoholic right. or somebody does uh, something brutal and it puts a nicer picture on it if you can call it a nicer picture right? because you don't have to damn the, your other, the other spouse. Although even if one spouse commenced a, a divorce proceeding based on that ground, the other could counterclaim on one of the, of, of the long time, long standing uh, grounds. Very true. You're very well versed and you're asking me questions and you know what you're very, very astute. You're right. So ultimately, the divorce proceeding could still get ensnared in uh, allegations of, right. of cruel and inhuman treatment right. or adultery. Correct, Judge. Right. And also, people forget that the divorce is just one half of a divorce. The other half is called, but what I call, how much? It all comes down to two words, how much? How much money, how much insurance, how much on the house, how much on the on the retirement funds, how much on the 401ks, how much alimony, maintenance payments, child support, how much? Because you start to be determined that we need X number of dollars to live. And by the way, two cannot live as cheaply as one. Right. You got one house, one car maybe, or one television set or one, but when you separate, you gotta have a home for your children if you get them on the weekends or during the week. And there's two homes. And that's why another reason that there's many, many foreclosures. People can't afford two homes and uh, living two separate lives with two separate, with the same income, many times with less income. With the mortgage going up, food prices going up, cost of the divorce with the attorneys and the lawyers, and now they gotta set up two separate households. People have gotta think twice, four times, 10 times about what I'm doing because it's gonna have a tremendous impact on their wallet. Exactly. Both sides. And that's, if and you, I'm talking against getting a divorce. I understand I'm that. talking about not coming to me or to other uh, experienced lawyers to get the divorce. Try to save the, mortgage, the, the marriage because to keep her is cheaper and to keep him is cheaper if it can be salvaged. If it can be salvaged. Work at it. Just work at it. Don't quit. Don't surrender at the first argument, the first fight, because in every marriage there's arguments, fights, differences. You're two different people from two different lifestyles, and now you come together, so it's bound to be problems. And this, this uh, breaking down of marital assets, is that what the state legislature refers to when they talk about equitable distribution? Is that what they're referring to about marital assets? Or Well, that's still up for debate. The <laughs> equitable distribution, that part is usually tried. Sometimes the judge will what they call bifurcate or separate. First you got to get the divorce. If you don't qualify for the divorce and the judge denies the divorce, you never do reach Correct. equitable distribution or child support or dividing the house. You just stay married. Right. It's hard to people to say, I got to stay married. You do. If the judge says no marriage, no divorce, it's, the judge is the captain of the ship and the judge rules the courthouse in the courtroom as I don't have to tell you. And that's the judge's decision and yes, you can still remain married even though it's not favorable to you as an individual. In your 60 years of practice, have you seen, have you, have you met uh, uh, situations where actually the court did not grant the divorce? Well, after, uh, su subsequent to a trial on that issue? If I do, you mean of my own practice? Or, or it, it, oh, well, I've seen not it, just intimately to you, but uh, otherwise uh, throughout the, the state of New York. I've seen, seen it one? happen in my practice right. uh, very, very, very infrequently, and the same applies to other lawyers. Right. Very infrequently. Right. Because usually you can change your grounds and so forth, because sometimes people will start a divorce on grounds that are innocuous. And the judge by the law says, I have to deny this divorce because you don't meet the standard of proof required for me as the judge to grant the divorce. There's not enough evidence, relevant evidence. So he, has to, he or she, the judge has to dismiss the complaint. But you just have to amend it. Not just the, necessarily there, but the next day you do amend it. And right. Change it or change the grounds because 
what starts out in the person's mind as an easy divorce, they said, well, we won't make it too difficult in the, com in the verify complaint. Right. I'll make it easy, and that backfires. Exactly. So you've got to be very careful. And there are some times that the court will seek further information to support exactly. the allegations, support exactly. the grounds. You know, and, and you know, Bob, your, your insight as to uh, letting people know how expensive it can be and how unsettling it can be, not just for the parties, but for their extended family, that it has an impact um, on, on a wide range of factors, not just on marital assets, but also on family and the greater family, and your encouragement uh, to people to first consider working it out, seeking a reconciliation. You know, that's, that's uh, no new position for you. In fact, in the 70s, you authored a divorce lawyer's case book, and, uh, which was a national uh, publication enjoyed by many attorneys throughout the country. And you were advocating the same then, weren't you? Yes. And I, lawyers do advocate trying to save it because they know how difficult the ramifications are when they go through it. And sometimes grounds that you feel are important are frivolous. And uh, the lawyer many times can see that. I mean, people do things that are not uh, acceptable to the spouse. It might be a one or two times things. You just don't want to destroy your whole life that, it, that started such in a beautiful wedding with beautiful people present and, and beautiful years. And uh, we've, we've had people that are married 50, 60 years getting a divorce. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense after a while. Right. Well, I think that uh, your uh, sage advice is, is, is well, um, well taken by all of our viewers here in the town of Colony. You've been at 90 State Street now practicing law and primarily uh, matrimonial law for all of that time. And of course, uh, I've been down at 90 State Street since 1988, I believe. And of course, 90 State Street in and of itself is a storied history in a variety of, of capacities, certainly in the practice of law. Um, uh, many uh, significant uh, attorneys, law firms have practiced in and out of 90 State Street over the years. It was really the hub of law practice uh, for many, many years. And, uh, but your family, when you went there, it wasn't just, it wasn't your first family's visit to 90 State Street. In fact, as you and I know, the building was uh, opened in the late 20s, and I believe um, you told me that uh, your family had one of the first businesses in 90 State Street. My father's uh, opened a, a men's store at uh, 90 State Street. The year was built, 1929, where the coffee shop is that you can see from State Street. Right. And uh, it was Khan's, and the name is there, and I've seen pictures of it. And my father was very proud of the fact that he came from Russia as an immigrant and built himself up as a haberdasher, or as they call it, with beautiful clothes and ties. Would you like to buy a tie, by the way? Well, I got so many from my family's uh, store, W.E. Walsh and Sons, which was across the street. Up the block, yes. Yep, yep that's also, right. Yep, that's beautiful. right. And not only was 90 State Street well known, but uh, the property itself was the Globe Hotel, and all the famous people would stay at the Globe, State and Pearl Street. And when Martin Van Buren, the 36th president, I think he was, no, I don't, anyway, he follow, uh, followed Andrew Jackson, and he was the governor of New York, and that's where he, his office was, and that's where he uh, lived at 90 State, it wasn't 90 State Street, but that's where it was. Right, right there in the corner. Right, and Albany is, goes back to the 1600s. You bet. Alexander Hamilton practiced law in Albany, and the man who killed him in a duel. Aaron Burr. Aaron Furr in 1804 in Weehawken, New Jersey, practiced law in Albany. They practiced against one another, and, uh, and they worked together on many cases. And Albany's got a great history of many uh, Chester Arthur is from Albany, one That's of our right. presidents. And, um, Buried Franklin, in our cemetery. And Franklin Roosevelt, of course, uh, was the governor of New York State. And uh, Albany is uh, very historical, called Fort Orange. And um, I'm proud to be an Albanian. Well, and when I consider Colony part of our, uh, part of our Albany. Well, and you know what Colony means. I believe that it means is the land outside the fort. 
And here we are. Yeah, here you are, outside, <laughs> outside the Fort Orange. Outside the Fort, that's right. Well, the, your practice has certainly been distinguished over the years, and, and, and I'm always curious as to um, attorneys who have so much wisdom as you do, how you've seen the local practice evolve over the years. Many of us fondly refer to special terms yeah. and opportunities for the local bar to get together and see each other on a routine basis. And much of that has been eliminated out of our practices. You and I see each other passing at 90 State Street, but otherwise opportunities for all attorneys to join, which was uh, set up initially by the court system, have now all been removed. And unless the Albany County Bar Association is calling a gathering of attorneys, there's rarely a case at the county courthouse that we're all together again. Has that had an impact on your practice too? It, I think it had an impact and it changed the practice of law. Yes. Every Friday was a special term day and all the lawyers would gather, a hundred and some lawyers, and, and they'd bring their motions before the presiding judge and argue it. But meanwhile, the, the group of lawyers that were in the room would be talking, would be socializing, and would be saying, what about this case? What do you think we can do? Can we work something out? Can these, not so much matrimonials, because there weren't so many, but there were other types of cases. And you would try to talk to somebody about, the, the person on the other side, the lawyer on the other side, about settling it or making some compromises or, or exactly. making some negotiations of some type. And it also brought about a, a warmth or a, a fraternal feeling between lawyers. So you knew everybody. And everybody was an, uh, an adversary, but friendly adversary. Exactly. So There's you, a level of collegiality. There, that's right. And it was a very f fine. It was very enjoyable. And then matrimonials became so prevalent and so much, they divided the special terms because it couldn't accommodate so many of the matrimonials, which increased every year from from a few thousand to tens of thousands. So they set up a se separate special term for just matrimonials. And then the other motions were heard before another judge. And another thing, graduating law school, there were many fields. It was surrogate or, or wills, automobile accidents, and uh, uh, matrimonials. Today, there are hundreds of fields. So therefore, the law is open to people that want to go into sports medicine, sports law, That's right. uh, education law, and uh, if my son is out in California, uh, theatrical law, entertainment law, and any field that you enjoy working in, a lawyer is part of that process. So it makes going to law school, I think, more enjoyable, more interesting, and it opens up vistas of information and. And the world is your oyster. You can become a lawyer and go to Japan. Exactly. Yes, and I have a daughter at Albany Law School right now, my oldest, and uh, I think there's great opportunity there. And I met her. Yeah. Yes, she did. And well, uh, to her, to her great fortune. I. Yeah. And not only is, I don't know how smart she is, but she must be smart. She's your daughter, but I, I don't know if it's. Well, proper. she's her mother's daughter. Yeah. But it's. I don't know if it's proper to say she's a beautiful woman. Well, that's very nice of you, uh, Bob, and she's very special uh, to me as well. I'm very special that she's at Albany Law School. I'm a graduate, you're a graduate. My grandfather was a graduate of Is Albany right? Law School in 1910. And uh, so uh, my affinity for the he, school. He graduated in 1910? Yes, he did. Yes, I knew him. Did. He was in my class, wasn't he? Yeah, well, no, just a, uh, a couple of years ahead. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, um, uh, certainly um, as wise as well. And you know, you've been a member of the Academy of, of Matrimonial Lawyers throughout most of your practice as well. And you mentioned something earlier to me that was interesting and to our um, uh, resident viewers as well, that the number of matrimonial cases has actually increased uh, many fold. Why? Many Why? Any ideas? What? Yes. I think it's a breakdown of our family life. And you see it in every aspect of it. You see it in, in the disrespect for teachers, disrespect for clergy, disrespect for judges, disrespect for authority, disrespect for uh, anybody that has any uh, ability to be in a position that makes a ruling for you or against you. They figure they're better than anybody else. They can do what they want to do. Everybody says, what's in it for me? Maybe it's greed. I see it on the television, American greed. And, uh, and it all starts with the family unit. 
if that breaks down and there's nothing that keeps the husband and wife together with the children for breakfast or what's going on in school, I had a good day, that's not enough. He had a good day, oh, that's nice. He had a good day, tell me what you did. Let me well, see your exactly. science homework. That's an interesting project. Be part of your children's life and build, build something. Don't destroy something. And if it works in the family, it'll start to expand to, to bigger units than that. But little me or us cannot make it happen, except maybe in a little tiny aspect of what we do and what we live for and what we practice and how we live and, and uh, what we want to do in life. This is our, what we are. It's our life's work, your life's work. I know that. Well, you know, Bob, it's interesting that you uh, talked about uh, the disrespect uh, uh, for authority in, a lot, in, a various, in various conditions. Uh, uh, Judge Herrick joined us on Benchmark some months ago, and he said the same thing. He did? Yes, he did. He must be a wise man yeah. if he said what I said. Yeah. Well, he, he did. And, and, Don't you know, tell him what I said. Well, both, <laughs> both attorney and, and as Judge Herrick as, as sees uh, uh, a high volume of cases, as I do, and you have as well in 60 years of practice, and uh, the two of you both recognizing that there are certain things that have deteriorated in our society, which may have generated in more court time, more litigation, uh, more uh, more activity in courtrooms uh, themselves. Um, so it's, it's interesting that you've uh, both uh, had a, a similar viewpoint on one of the reasons why we are where we are today as well. What's brought that on? Why does society appear to be more casual, more disrespectful? You might find somebody that says, with the bumper sticker on their car, challenge authority, challenge authority. Mm. And of course, we're, we're in a fabulous country where we can ask questions and should. Uh, but what do you think's brought on this disrespect? How does that get encouraged and how does it get discouraged? Well, I see churches closing. I don't turn on the TV that a school didn't close somewhere. Teachers being fired. Right. Trouble between teenagers, bullies. I mean, the, there's chaos. Right. And um, the, the many wars that, that are going on all over that we're involved in. And the, and our boys are dying. And even they don't even let them die in peace. They pick at the funeral. Yeah. By the way, I've never heard anybody say uh, there's a separation of church and state. The funeral being a church affair and it should not be interfered with by individuals who pick it and say you should die or you didn't die for anything as they pick at funerals of a dead soldier. I mean, it's abhorrent. It's uh, uh, what causes it is so many factors that uh, we can't deal with them unless we get some people in there that are even congressmen. Pick up the paper. The, con the, the people here in Albany taking bribes, uh, not do derelict of duty, beating up women. I mean, I think it's a, it's a disease. How do you stamp out a, an epidemic? Right. Well, would, would, I got uh, the question. I don't have the answer. Well, well, that's okay. I mean, being able to uh, recognize in the big uh, picture uh, that you're able to recognize of what's wrong, and then that that first can then help people uh, diagnose how we can make that better. And uh, talented attorneys like yourself that stay in the practice of law. I look as, at attorneys as facilitators, and I believe they should be facilitators. And uh, in that way, and uh, as you are, and have you been for 60 years to facilitate and to solve problems instead of creating them. And I think uh, attorneys make um, uh, uh, great opportunities for society to do so many good things. Do you see, too, in the challenge of society, it seems to me in the news media reports that there are more um, uh, working families where both spouses are working than there were 50 years ago. Correct. Mom and dad are both out now, nine to five or more working. And uh, that's changed uh, the family dynamic a little bit as well. And the stress and strains that go with both parents working uh, to the capacities, uh, sometimes well into the, into the night, and then there's children as well. Has that had a stress or strain on the marital relationship, yes, do you think? Yes, very much so. When I grew up, not so much you, you're much, much younger, but I grew up in a small area, and in that small area of three or four or five blocks, there were 
the grocery store, small grocery store, the man who baked the bread, the man who fixed the shoes, the man who um, did the plumbing. They were all, you didn't have to go, didn't have to own an automobile. You right. lived within that small little area. And um, I, Coca-Cola spends $100 billion a year advertising. The little poor little guy that was the plumber around the corner from me, he had it on the side of his truck, and I, here I remember it today. It didn't cost him a nickel, but the best advertising I ever heard. Uh, pipes to fix, joints to screw, get Lapidus, and he'll do it for you. <laughs> and he, I remember it, here it is 75 years later. I remember his advertising. Exactly. Yep. But that's the way you used yes. to live, and everybody knew everybody, and every, if, if somebody saw you doing something that wasn't correct, they'd say, I'm going to tell your mother or your father. And you didn't do it. You wouldn't want to be in bed with the rabbi or the priest or the parent or the school person. You respected them. And how it broke down, well, right. there's, there's... Neighborhoods more. controlled their own and, and maintained their own. And, and right. some but, of that is... But we have to learn time. to live with... That's not the good old days. You've got to learn to live today I get it. with what we've sprawled all over. Well, that's right, too. I know. In order to go from Albany to um, Colony at one time, you know, probably you had to go by horseback, and maybe it took four or five hours. Now it takes four or five hours with the traffic. Well, it can. It certainly <laughs> can as well. And uh, we're, we're very fortunate to um, uh, be able to enjoy you today, Bob. Your practice has touched so many in, uh, in, in a variety of different ways. And you come from a legal family as well. Your brother, an attorney. And a surrogate judge. Here and, in Albany County. And also a Supreme Court judge in the seven districts, seven judicial districts. That's and right. And Governor uh, um, President Clinton and Congress taking four years to approve him to be a federal court judge, which he is. And I'm proud of him. He's wonderful. But my mother always liked him better than me, so uh, I understand. Well, he's, uh, he's certainly uh, been uh, a distinguished jurist in, in yes. all those capacities. He's and I've wonderful. had the good fortune of being uh, in front of him and, uh, and just um, uh, um, looking up to him as one of our mentors and the judiciary here, certainly locally yeah, but as I, well. He's my brother, but his reputation is uh, nationwide. He's terrific as a judge. He's been terrific as a lawyer when he practiced with me. Well, he learned so much from you, too, because I know he co-authored uh, the book that you wrote, uh, Divorce Lawyer Casebook. Yes, he did. Uh, so that you were able to uh, provide him uh, with a tremendous amount of uh, information but, as well and shared that with him. Yes, and he shared with me. He was graduate of Harvard Law and Oxford University in England, and he'd probably be the prime minister of England if he wanted to be, but he came back to the country that he loved. Well, we're all so proud to have you here today, and uh, Bob Kahn has uh, certainly had an impact, a positive impact on the, pro on the practice of law here in the Capital Region and also in the entire state of New York. And thank you for joining us today, Bob. It's been a, certainly a pleasure. You've been too kind with your compliments. I will try to live up to them with the next 20 or 30 years of my practice. I'll do the best I can. I'm just 84, so I've got a long road ahead of me. Well, we look forward to your continuing practice, uh, and also I look forward to seeing you tomorrow down at 90 State Street. I'll see you at 90 State Street. Yes, you will. Thank you, Bob, for being here. Thank you, Judge, for inviting me. My pleasure. I'm Judge Peter Crummy, and thank you for joining me on Benchmark.